Hello everyone and welcome to part three of our textbook. Um, this lecture corresponds with the section asking what is gender. So in this uh, recording I'm going to focus primarily on introducing you to the primary theories of sex, gender, and sexuality which our authors will be often using, referring to, or contending against in their respective papers. Um, I won't be going through each of the authors individually to try to keep this on the shorter side of things, so please make sure to look through those PowerPoints more thoroughly when you have the time. I'm also going to be referencing a comparison sheet which I've included on slide four, um, and I use a lot of shorthand in that, so I'm going to go through that with you so that you can understand how to utilize that for reference um, both throughout the course and also in our writing assignment if you're interested. So um, the first couple slides in this PowerPoint actually discuss a lot of elements of biological sex that I introduced in um, one of our first lectures. So I'm not going to go through it again here, but please make sure to revisit that lecture if, uh, if you're interested. Um, so again, we're noting here the difference between the concept of biological sex from the concept of gender, which we're understanding here as something that is at least more culturally constructed, socially constructed, if not the same as sex, right? So the idea here is that we can understand sex and gender as two different things, right? Where one is connected to our biology and the other is connected to culture, or as we'll see with some of the um, later theories of sex and gender, that perhaps both of these things are socially constructed, right? So we're at least breaking away from the idea that gender has anything to do with biological sex, even if biological sex is, or even if our sex does happen to be tied to our biology, right? So we're at least understanding gender in this different way. And the reason that we want to understand gender in this way is because the way that we use that term is going to encapture a lot of aspects more that we might associate with our personality or um, other non-innate character traits, right? So things that we're not born with. Um, and the reason that we uh, understand gender is this way is because when you compare notions of femininity and masculinity f uh, in different cultures to one another, you can see that they're radically different, right? So in other cultures, um, especially uh, cultures who maybe perhaps speak what we call the romance languages, right? So uh, France, Spain, Italy. Notions of masculinity there are actually quite different from the way they are in the United States. For example, um, men in those countries are much more comfortable expressing uh, physical intimacy with one another without it being a sign of potentially the fact that they are homosexual, right? So you could have men who um, would engage, right? This is because uh, kissing is often much more uh, part of those cultural traditions, right? So they are willing to be more embracing of one another, right? Holding hands, right? All of these things that in a more um, Americanized context might signif signify something about one's sexuality in these cultures it need not, right? So there are a lot of other examples perhaps you can think of, but that's one reason to suggest that gender, right, even under its most limited construction uh, for us to understand it, is something that changes over time. We can even compare, you know, two moments of time in the same culture, uh, right? So notions of femininity in the United States in the 1950s versus the 2000s, right? So what it meant to be a woman, what it meant to be feminine was very different than, than it is now. You can even see this in um, uh, you know, certain artifacts of cultures, like if you compare the um, action figures from a long time ago to the action figures that um, kids play with today, you'll notice that the size of their muscles has like grown over time, right? So the idea of a, a strong masculine man would have been associated with smaller muscles size, right? Uh, they wouldn't need to be considered so large um, in order to be considered strong. Whereas now, right, we need like crazy over the top, you know, CGI muscles <laughs> to convey that type of strength. So again, maybe we can think of lots of different examples. And all this means is that gender is something that can be different than what one's biological sex is, right? And this is important to understand because a lot of individuals who fall outside of the sex and gender binary are often uh, judged with normative terminology, right, um, to say that they are less than, right, what we consider to be quote unquote normal 
natural or right, right? So it ends up being used as a criticism of them if they don't fall within those strict views. And so that's why we want to broaden our view. Okay, so that leads us into um, the first bit of uh, what we're gonna be focusing on today. And that is to give you a history of the different theories that have been used to explain sex and gender. Now, what these really are are four main categories of theories because there are lots of individual theories. Um, again, I'll talk about those in the comparison chart, but just so you get a sense of what these uh, ideas are and how they're supposed to be used, what we mean by a sex or gender theory is the same way we use theory in science, right? So this is a way to describe predict and explain relationships, right? So we don't just want a theory that describes reality as it currently is, right? Because as we just discussed, some of these things change. And so we also want a good theory is gonna be one that can predict what those concepts will mean in the future, right? So if, um, you know, one theory has a view of gender that was strictly tied to biology, right? That wouldn't have been predictive of the way we use the concept gender today, right? So that would not be a preferable theory for example. And then again, how it's going to explain relationships in this case, not between like people, but how are the concepts of sex, gender, and as we'll also see sexuality, perhaps related to one another, right? So for instance, you're going to see a lot of discussion of whether or not there is a causal relationship between sex, gender, and sexuality, right? Does one of them cause the other characteristics? And if there is a causal relationship, what direction does it go, right? Sort of a chicken and egg, you know, which came first type of situation. So what this does is it gives us a sort of structure and an organization to set around the language that we're using, the various traits that those concepts would correspond with, and then what that would mean for people's performance in the world, right? So when we say someone is masculine, right, we're going to get a better understanding of what that means if we understand what theory someone is operating under or what presumptions they're making about what is true, which will be captured, right, in whichever theory their ideas most align with, right? So this is a structure. It can help us make sure that our views are being consistent, right? So you don't, for instance, want to say that sex and gender are strictly tied to our biology, but I acknowledge that someone could be genderqueer, right? Because genderqueer wouldn't align with one's biology, right? There is no queer biological factor, okay? So those would be inconsistent views, right? your belief that this one category exists, right, doesn't fit with what your theory says those categories are supposed to be, right? So we wanna use these theories to make sure that we're, our views are consistent with themselves, right? And to also help us organize other people's ideas so that we can better understand them, right? So as I mentioned, the theories that we're gonna focus on are really general approaches. And um, I'm gonna make a note about the comparison chart because it'll help you understand it as chronological, right? So these general approaches, you know, happened around a certain time. So we're going to go to the older views first and then to move our way forwards towards more contemporary views. And then additionally, you can understand this progression in time as corresponding with how liberal or progressive those theories are, right? So as time goes on, the idea is that these theories become a little bit more what we would call inclusive, right? They are going to legitimize and provide structure to identities that fall outside of the sex gender binary, right? Uh, identities that are not what we would call heteronormative. Okay, so the idea is that these are gonna become more liberal as, the, as we move through the comparison chart. Okay, so in that, with that understanding, we're taking a look at biological determinism, interpersonal theories, which are tied to the social and psychological factors that go into someone building their own gender identity more broader cultural theories, typically associated with various uh, conceptions of social constructivism. So the idea that your gender identity, sex identity, whatever it is, is constructed by the society you're brought up in. And then finally, the critical approaches, which are typically associated primarily with postmodernism, right, or poststructuralism, as well as standpoint theory, which is going to be uh, something that we're, we're going to look more deeply at later on in this quarter. So I want to point out that the order here is the order from in, uh, in time, right, from the oldest theories to the most current ones. 
as well as their list in general progression. You can also think of it like uh, circles within each other, right? So biological determinism would be in the center, the smallest circle, in the sense that it is the least inclusive, right? So biological determinism is really only going to legitimize, right, what we would call cis men and cis women, right? Those who are born as biological males, who identify as men and who are attracted to women, right? And those who are cis women, those who are born as biological females, identify as women and are attracted to men, right? What we are traditionally called the norm because we live in a heteronormative society, right? So the least inclusive view is biological determinism. Then we move a little bit broader, right? So we move into the interpersonal where it says, okay, it's not just about you and perhaps your body. It's also about the people that you interacted with in your life, right? So that's going to include uh, primarily your family members or anyone else who was involved in uh, your upbringing, especially during the first five to ten years of your life. Then the uh, broader one, right, going outside of just the family with number three and looking at how your entire culture and society affects your identity. And then four, you can think, think of as the largest circle. It's the most inclusive. Um, and there's a lot of really important points there um, that we'll talk about. So I'm going to go now to the comparison chart for you. But just so you know, there are um, detailed, uh, right, more complete explanations of these in the, in the following slides. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. So just so you know, you can see here that um, this is unfortunately not in the right order. So if you just switch the interpersonal and cultural, just flop those two, then it'll be in that progressive order. Um, I'm sorry that I, I didn't think of that when I made this, uh, this chart. Okay, so we're gonna start here with the biological approaches. Okay, so again, this is a general approach. The specific theories that take this approach tend to be naturalism and essentialism. Um, a lot of these tend to rely on one another. Naturalism is more the metaphysical idea about, um, you know, where truth comes from, right? So we're going to be getting a naturalistic explanation, something that is defined by quote unquote nature, right? Not something that is uh, made or altered by human agency. Um, and this, again, is going to be tied to views of essentialism, but essentialism is more uh, the metaphysics of identifying the object, right? So the essence of something um, is going to be, right, the core of how you define what it is. And of course, this is tied to naturalism because the essence of sex, gender, and sexuality are going to be seen as something that is determined by nature. Right, so you can see that I have um, for each theory, right, or each approach, up here at the top we have um, how it understands sex, the concept, how it understands the concept of gender, how it understands the concept of sexuality, and then of course, as I mentioned, the relationship between all three. And so to save space, you can see I've abbreviated S for sex, G for gender, SY for sexuality, right? So please just keep that in mind as you note my shorthand throughout. Okay, so as I mentioned, right, biological approaches think that sex is fixed, meaning that it's not something that it can be changed, right? It's whatever it is at the moment of one's creation, right? How, however you envision that, right? Um, although with naturalism, of course, it's going to be through evolution, right? So however those d uh, factors are determined, right, by nature, that's how they will remain. They're not uh, capable of change throughout one's life. And so because of this, we have um, unfortunately an incorrect understanding of naturalism here in that biological approaches to sex and gender typically only assume that there are two biological sexes, male and female, and that these two things are opposites. But of course, as we already know, these are not the only two biological sexes that are possible. We have uh, what we call intersex individuals, what were previously called hermaphrodites. But again, there are many different combinations of internal and external sex organs. And so there's quite a variety more, right? There's not just two biological sexes um, that one can be born. And again, if we're talking about nature, if we move beyond the human species and look at uh, non-human uh, animals, we can see that in certain species, um, there is actually the possibility in nature for the, their sex to change. I, what is it, seahorses or something, <laughs> right? Where the, um, or no, the seahorses are when the males carry the babies. So starfish, there's some sea creature that actually changes its biological sex so that it can engage in what is called asexual reproduction, right? It can reproduce all on its own by switching its biology to have both the male and the female sex organs necessary to create life, 
right? So again, unfortunately, even though the biological approach does think that sex is determined by nature, it has an incorrect view of nature, unless you're looking at like maybe a newer biological approach, of which I haven't seen any. But biological approaches typically mistakenly assume that there are only two biological sexes that occur in nature. And they're going to maintain what is called the principle of coherence, which means that your sex is going to causally determine and be identical to your gender. And they assume a heteronormative form of sexuality, meaning that the quote unquote correct sexual orientation is to match these opposites together, right? They consider this to be a quote unquote natural pairing, although again, this is an incorrect understanding of nature. There are many species of animals, including humans, who engage in same-sex behavior, right? So there, this is, again, unfortunately based on an incorrect understanding of nature, but this is the view nonetheless, and is probably the one you grew up learning about, right? Again, heteronormative, this is the norm that we live in, is the biological approach, the most limited of them. So because of this principle of coherence, there is really seem to be no difference between sex and gender, right? So when you hear those terms used interchangeably, you're probably dealing with someone who maintains one of these theories under the biological approach, right? And so your sexuality is simply a property of your gender, right? It's a facet of being a woman that you're attracted to men, right? It's a facet of being a man that you're attracted to women is the idea. And of course, working backwards causally, that gender, right? Identifying as a man, identifying as a woman is believed under this view to be directly caused by your biological sex. Okay, so I'm going to come back to the cultural approach because I want to go in order, right? So moving on to the second most inclusive approach, these are the interpersonal approaches. So moving now beyond just your body, your individual, you know, physical nature to a notion of how your sense of self gets developed through the people who are in your life during primarily the first five years. These um, are the most formative, uh, according to psychologists, is in the creation of our sense of personal identity, right? So there are other things, of course, that come later on and that we're constantly developing psychologically our entire lives. But again, when it comes to your sense of who you are, right, it's really the first three to five years of your life that the primary uh, development of that comes in, right, which is why it's so difficult and challenging and often traumatic, right, for people to, you know, question their identity later in life because, you know, it's so deeply ingrained by that point. It really, there's really no part of our lives that's not affected by that. So it's important to note that these interpersonal approaches are typically corresponding to certain uh, approaches to psychology that were dominant at the time. And so this includes psychodynamic theory, social learning theory, and cognitive development theory. These are just different explanations as to how our interactions with other people in those first couple formative years really you know, have a causal impact on who we are. So psychodynamic theory typically um, ends up being something closer to Freud, right, Freudian psychology and the idea that, um, you know, your relationship with your immediate parents, specifically the opposite sex parent, right, although there's a break from the mother that every child needs to make, um, that those are the relationships that will define every aspect of your identity, but especially your sexuality. So if you haven't studied Freud, it's fascinating. We still uh, use a lot of those ideas today. Um, notion He thought that, you know, the reason that women or those who identify as women are attracted to men is because they had what he called penis envy, right? And so there are, are these other interesting facets that have to do with um, the... Uh, uh, Electra and uh, I'm blanking on the other one, right? These sort of Greek names, um, but these complexes where someone is in love with their parent of the opposite sex because they didn't make the right transition, right? They didn't learn how to redirect that attraction to someone else. So there's all these really interesting ideas here. But the problem, of course, is one that um, none of these theories talk about b sex at all or our biology. And if we know anything, especially about modern psychology, we know that most of the stuff that happens with our mind is a combination of biological factors and environmental factors, right? So, you know, if you experience depression or anxiety, that could be as a result of your environment and your circumstance, and or it could be a result of a chemical imbalance that you have, 
right? Or some other um, uh, mental challenge, right? That you're dealing with. Perhaps, um, you know, bipolar disorder runs through your family, right? Or major depressive, right? So we have those biological elements and our environmental ones. But unfortunately, these interpersonal approaches didn't give any account of our biology, and they didn't really talk about biological sex at all. The only sex they were interested in was our sexuality and our sexual encounters, right? So a lot of it was engaging in our actions, which is why didn't fo those theories don't focus on sex. So we just have a not applicable here. But they did give um, a much more uh, generous understanding of gender. So here I have um, sort of two different approaches that you can find in these respective theories. Oh, uh, just to mention social learning theory is the idea that again, your society um, is you're going to sort of uh, mimic or copy other individuals who are prominent that could be adults that you know, it could be uh, people on TV, right? So anyone that's sort of in your visible sphere, you will look up to and you'll model your behavior off of them. Cognitive develop theory, uh, cognitive development theory, excuse me, has to do with um, kind of laying out the steps of how our gender identity is constructed over time. There's a number of these different theories. If you're ever interested in them in more detail, I can uh, share some, some notes with you about that. But the basic idea was that um, you know, we engage in certain play with other individuals, which sets up certain rules, certain sort of norms and codes that are sort of embedded in us over time with which we sort of build this uh, construction in our head of what it means to be X, right? What it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, right? And so what's interesting about these interpersonal approaches is that they allow for a lot of variety, right? Because our environmental situations are all different. And so because of this, as I was mentioning, their view of gender is going to be a much more liberal in that they're going to say that gender is not biologically determined, but is socially constructed. And because of that, we have the two binary notions of gender, as well as other possibilities, right? They kind of leave open the idea that, right, there could be other views, but unfortunately in some of the early, especially psychodynamic theories of Freud, if you fell outside of the binary, that was typically viewed as being the result of some sort of trauma or, um, uh, you know, error as you were making your progression or developing your sense of gender identity. So while they acknowledge a greater variety of gender identities, they're not um, va normatively valuing them in the same way, right? masculinity and femininity are still going to be seen as positive associations, whereas if you fall outside of that, they're going to see that as quote unquote something being wrong, right? Something went wrong in your in your development. And this is again tied to sexuality. So we have uh, two different models here, right? So one is that your gender determines your sexuality, right? So the, the causal relationship is going this way. And these other views are the idea that your sexuality influences your gender, right? So the causal relationship just goes the other way. And so again, overall, they're gonna have the same ideas about gender as being socially constructed as well as sexuality. But uh, even though sexuality is unfixed, right? Meaning that they, you could, um, you know, it's not going to be determined by your nature. That doesn't mean it's fluid. So that doesn't mean that it can change all the time. So it's not going to be fixed on your nature, which allows at least for homosexuality, but it's not going to be considered fluid and that they're not going to say that you can change your sexuality over time, right? Which um, some of the more progressive theories will allow for, right? So an example of gender being the foundation of one's sexuality, right, is the idea that, um, you know, you might uh, identify a certain way, right, let's say you identify as being particularly feminine, and if you, the social construct, sorry, over here, if the social construction of your femininity is such that feminine women are meant to be with very macho men, then that will generate an attraction for you towards very masculine men. But if you were a very feminine woman that grew up in a different society, right, different cultural norms, and very feminine women were meant to be with very um, effeminate men, right, or, uh, you know, something that is less associated with the machismo sort of notions of masculinity, right? So uh, a less aggressive form of masculinity, well then you that would generate a different sort of uh, level of attraction for you, right? So again, it's unfixed and it allows for many possibilities, but it's not fluid. It can't change over time. This other causal direction, right, saying that your sexuality determines your gender, 
is such that, okay, let's say you are a heterosexual. So you are um, a, a particularly feminine woman, right? And in your society, the kind of men you're attracted to, right? Or sorry, I should start with your sexuality. So you, you are a heterosexual woman in this case, and you are attracted to, let's say, macho men, right? So if the men, the macho men in your society are attracted to very feminine women, you might perform a gender or, you know, cultivate a gender that is especially feminine, right? So the idea is that your gender is serving a role here to attract the person that you're, you're interested in, right? So gender here is then just a reflection of your sexuality, which is really interesting, right? So lots of different views on, on which way it goes that have some interesting implications. All right, so going back up again, this is our third most liberal view. These are the cultural views. So again, expanding a little bit beyond just the people in our immediate sphere and looking at the larger society, right? Every single message that we get from society about what sex and gender are. And here, um, you'll notice that these theories don't have much to say about sexuality. Uh, and this is really interesting. I'm not sure if it's because they don't think uh, society comments on sexuality. I think they absolutely do. Um, or if their focus more is here just on uh, other aspects of your identity. I'm not really sure. <laughs> but uh, these theories don't have uh, anything to say about sexuality. They apply mostly to your sex and gender. Um, identity. And so these views are social constructionism, anthropology, and social interactionism. And these just tend to be, again, different ways of approaching how they account for these views. So in a social constructivist account, right, we're taking the entire society and understanding how that society defines or has constructed a sense of what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, and so on and so forth. Anthropology is more at looking at how these views have evolved over time and um, accounting or giving an account that can sort of explain this evolution, right? So not one that's so fixed in time. Social construction, constructionism, on the other hand, is very much fixed in time. Social interactionism takes in a little bit more of the interpersonal account, right? So how do our interactions within that society, right? So sort of adopting a little bit of both. So again, different ways of all accounting for how our cultural experiences, our societies, those places in which we are born and raised, those experiences, how they form who we are. So there are two different approaches to this. Um, one of them assumes the sex gender binary, so it's a little bit more of a limited view. This definitely is uh, more with anthropology, right, because these views um, have been around for so long, right, and were uh, much less inclusive the farther back in time we go. So they thought that sex was fixed, determined by nature, right, that mass male and female were universal differences, right, that they, these can be found, anthropologically speaking, in every major culture. Now, what is interesting, though, is that even in cultures that assumed the sex gender binary, there are instances of there being more than two genders, right? So even though having only two genders seem, or I'm sorry, only two sexes seems to be a universal um, at fact of history, right? There is a gendered difference going back through history as well, meaning that in some cultures, I think I mentioned this before, there is a third gender. In some cultures, there are, are up to five or six different gender type identities, right? So this is something that has allowed even uh, the more limited interpretations, like the anthropological ones, to acknowledge that gender is still socially constructed, right? It's determined by the culture. And so depending on the culture, it can be fixed or unfixed, right? It sort of depends on how that view or that um, culture views it. So because of this, this more limited um, or narrow anthropological cultural approach is going to say that sex and gender are distinct. They actually don't think there's any causal relationship between them at all. And that since sex is uh, determined by nature, your gender is just simply learned and they utilize uh, various um, communicative uh, theories like sex role theory. The more uh, liberal of the two thinks that there is a connection between sex and gender and that both sex and gender are socially constructed, right? So that's allowing for more than just two, but that there is a singular direction of causality and it goes from gender to sex. So this is really interesting. They do not think that the causal relationship is that sex comes first and then gender comes second. Social constructivists think that the existence of concepts of gender actually determines and makes us project onto the body, 
things that we consider to be reflections of one biological sex, right? So this has to do with the idea that, um, you know, because we are are socialized to have certain concepts of femininity, right, as being uh, particularly soft or weak or fragile, then we will actually impose those characteristics onto the bodies of other females, right? So we will um, hold, you know, young infant girls differently than we will hold young infant boys. We will speak to them in different tones of voice. We will um, allow them to engage in certain types of activities and scold them for not engaging in the right activities, right? And so the idea is that we actually do this like reverse normalization where we start off with our socially constructed idea of gender and then we impose that on nature and act as if it was always there, right? So that is going to be um, the view that is held mostly by the authors that we see this week, right? This social constructivism, which really takes this more liberal conception, right? Where we have to talk about there being a connection between gender and sex because our concept of one influences our concept of the other. But we just need to be aware that because these views are socially constructed, and societies change, so too those concepts can change. Okay, and so this leads us to our last set of approaches, the critical approaches. And so this includes uh, things like standpoint theory, which we're going to see uh, when we get to our section on epistemology, postmodernism, or as I mentioned, it's sometimes known as poststructuralism, and queer performative theory. And so here too, we have a sort of separation of um, sort of two strains of thought on how to view sex, gender, and sexuality. But one of the things that all of these have in common is that they, they take the most liberal approaches to all of them, right? And they especially take the most liberal approach to the relationship between sex, gender, and sexuality in that they don't think there's a connection at all, right? And so um, according to uh, this first row here, the separationists, right? They're gonna say that these things are not causally connected. They just happen to be housed in the same body, right? In the same person. And so because of that, you know, we can talk about them, you know, relating to one another, but there really isn't a causal relationship. Whereas this uh, mutual dependence approach is going to say that there is no coherence, they're completely unfixed, and instead depend on mutual social construction, meaning that they're all sort of developing independently at the same time. And so because of that, you know, in our minds, we conflate them and we, we confuse them as being connected, but really they're not. Okay, so uh, both the separation and mutual dependence account uh, cr of versions of critical approach theories think that sex is socially constructed, right? Think that gender is not only socially constructed, but fluid, unstable, and in uh, the case of the separation account, it's not just socially constructed, but performed, meaning that your gender is something you can actually turn on and off, maybe not consciously, but it's like the way you would perform your femininity at home versus the way you would in the world, or the way you're comfortable being a man at home in private versus being a man out in the world, right? So this is uh, a really interesting view of gender identity as a type of performance, right? So, but at least, uh, you know, the notion is that they're socially constructed, if not, right, constantly changing in this way. Sexuality here is again going to be unfixed, diverse, and then in the case of separationists, they're going to say fluid, right? Meaning that our sexuality can change. This often has to do with the fact that they think our gender identity is performative, right? So because you're performing in a certain way, you might also, right, perform your sexuality or engage in different sexual preferences, right, depending on the situation. And so this would um, allow for what is being discussed now as pansexualism, right, which is the idea that you could be potentially attracted to anyone, right, regardless of their sex or gender identity or their sexuality, right, your, your sexual um, attraction and orientation is to the person, right, not to the label or something like this. Or again, in the mutual dependence case, a just basic idea that it is socially constructed, unfixed, and diverse, right? So it means that we can account for all of the different types of sexual orientations here, right? Fluid means that one is changing, perhaps one doesn't even have a sexual orientation. 